you cannot teach the titan law as given you are bringing back what is dead to life he takes away the first that he may establish the second the titan law is dead the bible says the dead shall be thrown into the lake of fire he killed malachi 3 that he may establish the second so if they take you to malachi 3 take them to revelation 22 that the dead shall be thrown into the lake of fire so the titan law has been killed it must not exist side by side the law of the spirit of life in christ jesus has set me what free from the law of sin and death join dr abel damino the senior pastor of power city international as he explores exegetically bible doctrine on tight and tithing date from sunday 14th of march to sunday 21st of march 2021 time monday 15th to saturday 20th 6 p.m daily sundays 8 a.m and 11 a.m gmt plus one join the broadcast on radio aquibum 90.5 fm uyo 11 a.m to 1 p.m xl fm 106.9 uyo 1 p.m to 3 p.m daily unuyo fm 100.7 3 p.m to 5 p.m comfort fm 95.1 uyo 6 p.m to 8 p.m inspiration fm 105.9 uyo 9 p.m to 10 p.m. and Heritage Radio 104.9 10 p.m. till midnight and also on Kingdom Life Network Station. Also live on Facebook at Abel Damino Public Figure, YouTube Abel Damino Ministries International, Twitter Abel Damino and Instagram at Abel Damino Watch Real Time. Host Doctors Abel and Rachel Damino. Don't miss out.
salvation. Say, Jesus is my salvation. Jesus is my righteousness. Jesus is my righteousness. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In the name of Jesus, Heavenly Father, we come before your word respectfully tonight and humbly. And we thank you for the opportunity to learn from your holy written word. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege to feed from your word. And we rejoice that the mighty Holy Spirit lives on our inside. So as we study your word tonight, I decree that everybody connected to this service tonight, revelation knowledge is gifted to you. I decree that bodies and yokes are destroyed. Whatever is not planted by God is rooted out. 
I decree that your people are built up, equipped, edified. And by the end of this service tonight, Jesus is glorified. Thank you for your blessing upon your word today. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer sees a powerful amen. amen. Glory to God. Lift your right hands to heaven. Let's release our feet together. As we say these words, I am born of God. I am born of the word. The word of God is my nature. I do not struggle to do the word. I do the word naturally. Therefore today, I will understand the word of his grace. I will be built up. By the end of this service, I will never be the same. Never ever be the same again. In Jesus name. And every believer says a powerful amen. We want to welcome everybody connected to this service tonight by way of Kingdom Life Network, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram. We're so glad to welcome all of you, social media community. And, you know, it's just a joy to know that brothers and sisters online are going to benefit from the teaching of God's word tonight. I also want to welcome the Aquaibom State community connected by way of Comfort FM, XL FM, Radio Aquaibom, UNUU FM, Heritage FM, Inspiration FM, all of you that are connected on these radio stations. I'd like you to call a friend and a loved one and tell them to tune to this radio station right now. Life is flowing through the airwaves. What a joy to have all of you. And uh, I'd like you to tell others, your friend, your colleagues, your neighbors to tune to this radio broadcast tonight. And all of the social media community, what a joy to have all of you co-laborers, brothers and sisters. Like you've always done before, do it again for me today. Let's get this gospel to the ends of the earth. I'd like you to invite a friend, tag somebody, create watch parties and share with all the groups on your page. Join as many groups as possible. Let, let, let this teaching go viral tonight. Let people come to the knowledge of the truth. Also help us put the messages on Monogram, Telegram, and WhatsApp group. What a joy to have all of you to labor with as we get the message of Christ to the ends of the earth. All our house churches and campuses around the world. What a joy to welcome all of you. And if you're connecting for the first time today, well, welcome to the broadcast. Fasten your seat bells for a gospel adventure tonight as we explore the riches of his grace. I'd like you to grab your pen, your notebook, your Bible. You can be seated with your sweet, smart self as we continue on our series, Understanding Bible Truth on Tithe and Tithing. And tonight we'll be exploring the first fruits and the firstborn offerings. First fruits and firstborn offerings. We are looking at the myth, the explanation, the practice, and the malpractice of the tithes, first fruit, and firstborn offerings. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse number 15. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse number 15. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Next, next verse. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Verse 17. That the man of God may be perfect. Truly furnished unto all good works. That's the word they are all. It says that from a child you have known the holy scriptures is the word Hagios grammar. The holy scriptures. What he's saying is that the scriptures are given for teaching. The scriptures are not given for citation. They are given for teaching. Meaning that the scriptures must be explained. That's why many people thought brother Paul was teaching marriage. But there's no teaching of marriage in the epistles. Let me repeat. There's no teaching of marriage in the epistles. They taught the married. They taught the married. Marriage is something you know without being born again. You don't have to be born again to know about marriage. That's why when you are married before you are saved... It doesn't make the marriage illegal. When you get married as an unbeliever, marriage is marriage. Whether you are a pagan, an atheist, or you are a, you know, a native doctor, or an idol worshiper. Once you get married, you are married. Alright, so there's no teaching of marriage in the scriptures. But the apostles taught the married. 
Because, you know, our marriage is not a teaching in the epistles. What we teach basically is like when Brother Paul said, Husbands, love your wives. He is not talking to everybody. He is talking to those he spoke to previously. In Ephesians chapter 4 verse 24. Look at the pretext. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 24. And that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So these are the people he's talking to. Look at Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1. Be therefore followers of God as their children. So when he now says to them, love your wives even as Christ loves the church, he's talking to those who have put on the Lord Jesus. They have put on righteousness and he's talking to those who are regenerated. So, those are the people he is telling to love their wives as Christ loves the church. You can't say that to the unbeliever. And you cannot say because the unbeliever doesn't love his wife, he is not married. Whether he loves her or not, marriage is marriage. Just like Paul didn't teach business. Paul didn't teach business. He taught those who are in business. He taught businessmen. He didn't teach them how to run their business. He didn't teach them how to make profit. However, he taught them how to be Christians while making profit. He taught them how to be Christians while making profit. You know, most of the time, we spend doing marriage seminars, single mingle, marriage honey, and all of that. If pastors had spent that time to teach believers how to walk in the spirit, walking in love, how to be godly, and how to act on the word of God, we will not put pressure on people with principles. Sixteen principles to finding a life partner. How to locate a life partner. Forty keys to a successful marriage. You wouldn't need all of that if believers just are taught how to walk in love, how to walk in the spirit, how to, you know, operate godly in this world. So the scriptures are given for teaching of a kerugma, the teaching of a specific information. And yesterday we established that this specific information is Christ and him crucified. So the scriptures are given for teaching. The word didascalia, teaching or explanation. And then from teaching and explanation, you have reproof. You have correction and you have instruction in righteousness. Now, let's focus on instruction in righteousness. Anything you teach, whether it is marriage, your teaching or giving or prayer... It must lead to instruction in righteousness. Whatever subject of scripture you're teaching, it must lead to instruction in righteousness. Now, that word instruction is the word pedia in the Greek. Pedia is used for nurturing people into growth. Nurturing people into growth. And that's the end point of learning. The end point of learning the scriptures is for growth. For growth. Not for amassing knowledge, but for spiritual growth. Scriptures are profitable for teaching. Didascalia. For reproof. Eleko in the Greek. And for instruction in righteousness, which is pedia. Of course, correction, ephanatonosis. Now that word growth, the word pedia, you see it in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4. Ephesians chapter 6 verse number 4, brother Paul admonishing parents. He says, and you fathers provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. In the nurture and admonition of the Lord. The word admonition means to make to grow and to be disciplined. Admonition. To make to grow and to be disciplined. It means the teaching of the word should produce nurturing. When people are taught, it should produce nurturing or a growing up. 
or growing up. That word pedia is taken from pedio in the Greek where you have judgment and discipline. You will find that for your further reading at home, Acts chapter 22 verse 3. Acts chapter 22 verse 3. First Corinthians chapter 11 verse 32. First Corinthians chapter 11 verse 32. Put up on the screen for me First Timothy chapter 1 verse 20. First Timothy chapter 1 verse 20. Of whom is Hymnios and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. That they may learn not to blaspheme. Where Paul talked about them learning not to blaspheme. That word learn means nurtured. That is, that they may grow up and in spiritual growth, they will not blaspheme. That as they grow by nurturing and by learning, they will not blaspheme. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 25. The same thing he's talking about. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 25. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God, per adventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. You know, per adventure, God will give them repentance. That is, they will come to a place of acknowledging the things they are being taught. Look at Titus chapter 2 verse 12. Titus chapter 2 verse number 12. Teaching us, teaching us that denying ungodliness... And worldly lost, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Teaching us. Teaching us. It means to grow up. Teaching us. It means as we grow up, as we grow up, we now deny ungodly loss. Denying ungodly loss is not the target. The target is growth. But as we grow, the appetite for worldly loss will die off. Okay? We are not struggling not to have lost. That's not our target. Our target is growth. So as we are being nurtured and we are growing, with, we outgrow certain threats. We outgrow certain appetites. Because with spiritual growth will come changes. Changes. Growth is change. Growth is change. Okay, so with spiritual growth will come changes. So instead of focusing on people's weaknesses and mistakes, take them and focus them on Christ. As they begin to feed on Christ and grow into Christ in their understanding, the appetites of the flesh dies naturally. So you're not struggling to live right. Mm -mm. You are concentrating on spiritual growth and right living becomes the resultant effect of spiritual growth. So we nurture so that people grow and as they grow, they deny ungodly loss. We deny that loss in the growth. We deny it in the growth. A spiritual growth, not salvation. That is why that verse says in verse 14 of Titus chapter 2, verse 14 of that chapter says, Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. It's not good works that bring salvation, but because you are now saved, you are zealous of good works. So the good works is after salvation. It's not pre-salvation. It's post-salvation. The grace of God that brings salvation. That is in spite of works. Then now, after you are saved, it begins to produce works in our lives. By virtue of being taught. By virtue of being taught. So many times people try to do the work of the grace of God. You know. They try to give people rules and regulations. Thou shall not. Thou shall not. They are bringing people back to Moses. Thou shall not. 
And in Christ, it's not do's and don'ts. In Christ, is spiritual growth. As we feed on the right diet and grow, we outgrow certain attitudes. We outgrow certain mannerisms. We outgrow certain traits that are not Christ-like. It is growth that takes care of that. Growth. And that's why people must be nurtured to a place of spiritual growth. Alright? So, he says the grace of God is what brings us up. If a man is born of the spirit, you don't use the flesh to train him. If a man is born of the spirit, you don't use the flesh to train him. If we are saved by grace through faith, it is by grace through faith we will grow up. If we are saved by grace through faith, it is by grace through faith that we grow up. Look at Colossians chapter 2 verse 6 Colossians. See what brother Paul says in Colossians chapter 2. As you therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. The same way you received Christ is the same way you walk in him. How did you receive him? Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. Ephesians chapter 2 verse number 8. For by grace are you saved through faith. So you receive Christ by grace through faith. How do you walk in Christ? You walk in Christ by grace through faith. Not by works. By grace through faith. That's why brother Paul will say to the church in Galatia. Oh foolish Galatians. Look at Galatians chapter 3 verse 2 and 3. Galatians 3, 2 and 3. He says to them foolish Galatians. This only will I learn of you. Receive thee the spirit by the works of the law. Or by the hearing of faith. How did you get born again? Was it works that got you saved or faith that you heard? You heard faith and you got saved. Now look at verse 3. <clears throat> verse 3. Are you so foolish having begun in the spirit? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? That's why he, you know, we said if you are not a Jew or a Levite, why are you paying tithes? If you are not a Jew or a Levite, why are you receiving tithe? Because tithe is for Jews. Tithe is for Levites. So if you, are, if you have been deceived to function like a Jew, when you are an African, a Nigerian, you are the people he will call foolish. All foolish Nigerians. Who has bewitched you? Being foolish has to do with the scriptures. It's not an insult. It's a description of your attitude towards the scriptures. Jesus said, Oh fools, slow of heart to believe. In Luke 24, 25 and 26. You know, every time people were called fools in the Bible, they were not angry. In fact, brother Paul said, are you so foolish? You know, he called them fool. Then he said to them, are you so foolish? All right. Now that word, pedia, where we started talking about instructing in righteousness, means to train up, to train up, to nurture, to train up or to educate, to educate. You'll find that in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5, Hebrews 12, 5, Hebrews 12, 7, Hebrews 12, 8. Hebrews 12, 5, 7, 8, and 11. Where brother Paul was using the word chastening. The word chastening there means to educate for growth. To educate for growth. Now, as a pastor, no matter the subject that you are teaching, it must produce spiritual growth. It must, the intent of Bible teaching is to produce spiritual growth. You must not just speak. The content must be rich enough to develop people into growth. Don't just speak. Don't just preach. Don't just be excited. Weigh the content. No matter the gyration and the excitement, that's not the target for teaching and preaching to get people excited and to feel like an orator. No. 
the intent of Bible teaching and preaching is to produce rich diet that develops people into growth. That develops people into growth. And growth means you will change the way you think. Growth means you will change the way you think. That's why Bible teaching is for correction. Correction means to adjust your mindset. To correct your thinking pattern. Because right thinking will produce right living. Right thinking will produce right living. Look, look at what Brother Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needed not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. That word study is the Greek word spudazo. It means be eager, be diligent. In other words, he is giving you a responsibility that you must show that you have been approved of God. You, the teacher or the preacher of the word, must show that you have been approved of God. That is, you have been tested by God. And after God tested you, he has seen you to be proper. You must show that in Bible teaching or preaching. You must show that God has tested you already and that with God, you are proper. So in your communication, that quality of God's approval must be seen in the diligence and in the weight of your communication of the scriptures. So do not go on the pulpit when you are not fully prepared. And when you are teaching and something comes to mind that you didn't prepare for before teaching, as much as possible, don't say it. Just keep it somewhere. So that when you get back home, you do diligence with it. Then in the next service, you can now say it with sound exegesis. A Bible teacher is not a showman. He's not looking for how to show off. A Bible teacher is a careful trainer. A careful nourisher. A careful educator. Because his intent is not to show off. His intent is not about him. In Bible teaching, we are not thinking of us. In Bible teaching, it's our audience that we have in mind. And we want to make sure that they are fed to the point of growth. They are fed to the point of growth. That's a scriptural truth. Okay? So, you find quality time. You prepare. So, you present it better. Remember, Jesus is not coming tomorrow. We still have time. People will still come to service next time. So you have enough time to still say that thing with sound explanation. And don't quickly preach what you have heard that you have not understood. Don't quickly preach what you have heard that you have not understood. Look at the word in Philippians chapter 2 verse 12. Please pay attention. Philippians Chapter 2, verse number 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Let's examine the word fear and trembling. But even before we examine the word fear and trembling, you know that scripture is a scripture that the legalists are always using. Walk out your salvation with fear and trembling. And they are not paying attention to the tenses. He didn't say walk for your salvation. You are not walking for, you are walking out you cannot work out what is not in. So salvation is already in. Working out means grow to a point where what you carry inside is felt outside by those around you. All right? So the word fear and trembling. Let me give you a background of Philippians 2.12. Paul was saying, when I am not there, let me see your obedience. 
That is in my absence when I'm not around. Let me see your obedience. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's when I am not present with you. That's the background. I'm just showing you a proper way of study. Alright, so when you see such a word, you look for the corroboration of such a word. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 3. And as I, wa and I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. In fear and in much trembling. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 5. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 5. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in singleness of your heart as unto Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 15. And his inward affection is more abundant toward you. Whilst he remembered the obedience of you all, how with fear and trembling you received him. Check. Did they all say fear and trembling? Did they all say that? Okay. So that word fear and trembling means sincerity. Sincerity. What he is saying is, when I am not there, be sincere. Serve your masters with sincerity. I was with you in much sincerity. So what brother Paul was teaching in those contexts was sincerity. So fear and trembling implies sincerity. How that? With fear and trembling, you receive him. That is, you have received him in sincerity. There is sincerity in what is being done. Which is where you have single-mindedness. Single-mindedness. That is one-mindedness or total devotion. I'm not saying fear and trembling means sincerity. I'm saying when it is used, it is used to imply sincerity. Read the context of what he's saying in 1 Corinthians 2, 3, Ephesians 6, 5, 2 Corinthians 7, 15, where we read, you will see exactly that. Now that's why he gives you the background that when I am there, do not just obey in my presence, but obey also in my absence. That is the true mark of sincerity. That the same way you obey in my presence, when I am absent, you still obey. It shows that you are sincere. <clears throat> are we in the building? Let's quickly examine the malpractice, the myth, and the practice of the first fruit and firstborn offerings. We have dealt with tithe almost totally exhaustively. All right? Now, <clears throat> when we say first fruit, it means that every year in January, people's salaries are supposed to go to some people. <laughs> some people want to collect everybody's salary. And if you do business and make profit, that month of January, all the profit is supposed to go to somebody. Okay? <clears throat> now, that word first fruit is an Old Testament terminology which is from the word first or beginning. First or beginning. It is the word reshit in the Hebrew. R-E-S-H-I-Y-T-H. -h. Let me repeat. R-E-S-H-I-Y-T-H. TH, Rashid. That word, you will see it in Genesis 1 1. Barashit, in the beginning. Barashit, Rashid. Okay, in the beginning. You will also see it in Genesis 49 verse 3. Reuben, you are the beginning of my strength. The beginning. That means the first is always the first. That word Rashid is used 51 times in the Old Testament. 
Look at Leviticus chapter 23 verse 9 to 14. Leviticus 23, 9 to 14. And the Lord spake unto Moses saying, verse, verse 10. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When you become into the land, the land. You know the land? The land we've been talking about. When you become into the land which I give unto you and shall reap the harvest thereof, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruit of your harvest unto the priest. Hold on. Look at me everybody. So this first fruit is about the promised land again. The first fruit is for Canaan. For those that are going to Canaan. When you come when you come to the land, Canaan, okay? So it's about Canaan. That means they never gave the first fruit until they got to Canaan. Which means Moses never gave first fruit. Which means Aaron never gave first fruit. Which means the generation that came out of Egypt, none of them gave first fruit because first fruit was to be carried out in Canaan. Now look at that Leviticus 23 verse 11. Leviticus 23 verse 11. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Next verse. And you shall offer that day when you wave the sheaf and heal lamb without blemish of the first year for a bond offering unto the Lord. 13. And the meat offering thereof shall be two, two ten deals of fine flour mingled with oil. An offering made by fire unto the Lord for a sweet savour. And the drink offering thereof shall be of wine, the fourth part of an hin. Verse 14. And you shall eat neither bread nor parched corn, nor green ears, bread, parched corn, nor green ears, until the self same day that you have brought an offering unto your God. It shall be a statue forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. All right? Now, please pay attention. So, it is a feast of the first fruit, which is normally called Pentecost. First fruit is Pentecost. Okay? The, 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 the feast of Pentecost or the feast of first fruits. Now look at that Deuteronomy again. Chapter 26 verse 1. Deuteronomy 26 verse number 1. And it shall be when thou art come in unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance and possesses it and dwelleth therein and dwelleth therein so it was done in the land that means they didn't practice the first fruit for 40 years and do not forget like we said about the tithe they had material blessings in the 40 years without tithing they were blessed everything they needed was supplied without tithing so when somebody says, if you don't pay your tithe, you to be tight, that should tell you it's just playing on you or manipulating your mind. Because they that were given the law of tithing did not pay tithe for 40 years and it was not tight. They ate manna, they drank water, their shoes never grew old, their clothes never grew old, they had pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire, they were totally taken care of for 40 years without tithing and it was not tight. So don't let somebody, you know, just play around your mind as if you never went to school. <clears throat> and if you allow people to play on your mind like that, you better get your school fees and refund it to your village and tell them you're sorry for wasting their school fees because you should be able to objectively and logically look at the scriptures and see these people never paid tight for 40 years. And he said they didn't lack anything in the 40 years. That means the generation that came out of Egypt never tightened. Moses never tightened. Aaron never tightened. That means, therefore, 
Nobody came out of Egypt apart from Caleb and Joshua who gave tithe. Only Caleb and Joshua. Why? Because it was Caleb and Joshua that entered the promised land. Which means by implication, they must have tithed in the promised land. Now the same thing with the first fruits. Same thing. And the, you know, look at that Deuteronomy 26 verse 1. Let me just read a few of the verses. Deuteronomy 26 verse 1. <clears throat> And it shall be when thou art coming unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance and possesses it and dwellest therein, verse 2. That thou shalt take of the first of all the fruit of the earth. So first fruit is to be done in Canaan. And we don't have Canaan in Africa. We don't have Canaan in Africa. Okay? It was to be done in Canaan which thou shalt bring of thy land that the Lord thy God giveth thee and shall put it in a basket. So because it is farm product, it's not money. First fruit is farm product. That's why you put it in a basket and shall go unto the place which the Lord thy God shall choose to place his name there. Now look again at verse 9 and 10 of the same chapter. Verse 9 and 10. And he had brought us into this place. And had given us this land. Even a land that floweth with milk and honey. Next verse. Verse 10. <clears throat> and now behold, since I have entered the land, I have brought the first fruit of the land. Which thou, O Lord, hast given me. And thou shalt set it before thy Lord thy God. And worship before thy God. Are you still in the building? Okay. <clears throat> you shall worship before thy God. So this is for the land. So why exactly were they giving first fruits? What was it for? Exodus 13 verse 2. Exodus chapter 13 verse number 2. Sanctify unto me all the firstborn. Whatsoever opened the womb among the children of Israel. Both of man and of beast it is mine you know it's just unfortunate that some pastors look for something in the old testament that has an application in a very careless manner without finding out whether it's applicable or not and just use it to manipulate people look at exodus chapter 13 verse 11 to 16 exodus 13 11 to 16 and it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore unto thee and to thy fathers, and shall give it thee, 12, <clears throat> that thou shalt set apart unto the Lord all that openeth the matrix, and every firstling that cometh of a beast which thou hast, the male shall be the Lord, 13. And every firstling of an ass thou shalt redeem with a lamb, and if thou will not redeem it, then thou shalt break his neck. And all the firstborn of man among thy children shall thou redeem. 14. And it shall be when the son accept thee in time to come, saying, Why is this? That is why are we doing this. That thou shalt say unto him, By strength of hand, the Lord brought us out from Egypt, from the house of bondage. Next verse. And it came to pass, when Pharaoh would have hardly let us go, that the Lord slew all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord all that opened the matrix, being males, but all the firstborn of my children I redeem. 16. And it shall be for a token upon thy hand, and for frontlets between thine eyes. For by strength of hand, the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt. So why was it done? The first fruit was done in Canaan to remember what happened in the land of Egypt. It was an offering for remembering what happened in the land of Egypt. So it was to remind them of what happened in the land of Egypt. Look at Exodus twenty-two twenty-nine. 29. Exodus 22, 29. Please pay attention. Thou shalt not delay to offer the first of thy ripe fruit and of thy liquors, the firstborn of thy son shall thou give unto me. Did you see liquors there? Next verse, 30. Likewise shall thou do with thine oxen and with thy sheep. Seven days it shall be with his dam. On the eighth day thou shalt give it me. Exodus 
34, 22. Exodus 34, 22. And thou shalt observe the feast of weeks, of the first fruits of wheat harvest, and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. Verse 26 of 34, Exodus 26, verse 26. The first of the first fruits of thy land thou shalt bring unto the house of the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not sit a kid in his mother's milk. Look at Exodus 23, 16. Exodus 23, verse 16. And the feast of harvest, the first fruit of thy labors, which thou hast sown in the land, and the feast of ingathering, which is in the end of the year, when thou hast gathered in thy labors out of the field. Look at verse 19. Exodus 23, 19. The first of the first fruit of thy land, thou shalt bring into the house of the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not sit a kid in his mother's milk. Look at Exodus again. I mean Leviticus chapter 2 verse 14. Leviticus chapter 2 verse 14. And if thou offer a meat offering of thy first fruit unto the Lord, thou shalt offer for the meat offering of thy first fruit. Observe what you offer as first fruit. Green ears of corn dried by the fire. Even corn beaten out of all ears. That's what they give as first fruit. Look at verse 16. Verse 16. And the priest shall burn the memorial of it, a part of the beaten corn thereof, and part of the oil thereof, with all the frankincense thereof. It is an offering made by fire unto the Lord. So the first fruit, again, is from farm products. It's not money. You know, when you, when you are explaining something to people, as a pastor, don't just make statements. That's why I'm taking time to show you how to teach others. You take them painstakingly through the scriptures and patiently read it. Read the scriptures. They are written so they can be read. So patiently read. is part of teaching and training. Not making statements and walk away. That is what has caused much error among charismatic circles. People are lazy. They don't want to read. They don't want to study. And you know, I, and when that happens, it's either things are said to deceive or the ones that are truth are not well explained. And when things are not well explained, you have no argument. You have no sound argument. So the recipient doesn't know how to go about what he has heard because he can't even explain it. Talk more of defending it. Look at Leviticus chapter 23 verse 9. Leviticus 23 9. And the Lord spake unto Moses saying, verse 10. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When you be come into the land which I give unto you and shall reap the harvest thereof, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruit of your harvest unto the priest. Next verse. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Next verse. 12. <clears throat> And you shall offer that day when you wave the sheaf and he lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto the Lord. Next verse, 13. And the meat offering thereof shall be two tenth deals of fine flour mingled with oil an offering made by fire unto the Lord for a sweet savor. And the drink offering thereof shall be of, ma of wine the fourth part of an heen. Verse 14. And you shall eat neither bread nor patch corn nor green ears until the self same day that you have bought an off brought an offering unto your God. It shall be a statue forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. So about the same thing. Numbers eighteen twelve. Numbers eighteen twelve. Lots of scriptures good for your health. All the best of the oil and all the best of the wine. Did you notice the items? oil, wine, and of the wheat, the first fruit of them, which they shall offer unto the Lord, them I have given thee. Oil, wine, wheat, are the things that you use for first fruit in, Bi in the Bible. Okay? <clears throat> Please pay attention. Deuteronomy 26 again, Verse 1, the emphasis is on the land. Look at verse 10. Deuteronomy 26 verse 10. 
And now behold, I have brought the first fruit of the land, which thou, O Lord, hast given me. And thou shalt set it before the Lord thy God, and worship before the Lord thy God. Alright? Look at verse 3 of the same chapter. Verse 3 of the same chapter. And thou shalt go unto the priest that shall be in those days, and say unto him, I profess this day unto the Lord thy God, that I am come unto the country which the Lord swore unto our fathers, for to give us, verse 5, verse 5, and thou shalt speak and say before the Lord thy God, a Syrian ready to perish was my father, and he went down into Egypt and sojourned there with a few, and became there a nation, great, mighty, and populous. Look at verse, verse 6, verse 6, mm -mm. and the Egyptians evil entreated us and afflicted us and laid upon us hard bondage, 7. And when we cried unto the Lord God of our fathers, the Lord heard our voice and looked on our affliction and our labor and our oppression. Verse 8. And the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with great terribleness and with signs and with wonders. Again, it's a reminder of what happened in Egypt. Look at Exodus twenty two twenty nine. 29. Exodus twenty two twenty nine, Thou shalt not delay to offer the first of thy ripe fruits, fruits, and of thy liquors. The firstborn of thy sons shall thou give unto me. Next verse. Likewise shall thou do with thy oxen and with thy sheep. Seven days it shall be with his dam. On the eighth day thou shalt give it me. How do you do it? Leviticus 25, 23. Leviticus 25, 23. The land shall not be sold forever. For the land is mine. For you are strangers and sojourners with me. So basically you see that he was referring to the land. And this will be effected in Canaan. Again in Proverbs chapter 3 verse 9. Proverbs Chapter 3, verse 9. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruit of all thine increase. Next verse. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. So the issue here was a commandment. Something to highlight. Take note number one. It was not done in 40 years. The first fruit. That's number one. Number two. It has to be done in Canaan. It has to be done in the land. Now let's run through some issues. So that we can have clarity. The first fruit. Just like the tithe. Will be what? Livestock. Farm produce. First fruit will be. Livestock farm produce. The first fruit was never money. It was never salary. And it was never a business profit. The first fruit was never money. It was never salary. And it was never business profit. It wasn't to be taken from slaves who were under employment. First fruit was not to be taken from slaves. It was from those who own a land and farm there. Whatever they got out of farm, they get first fruit. So it was fruit of the land. It was food and animals that were first fruit. Okay? Now, there were feasts and had to do with the planting season in Israel. That's why he gave them seasons. This is when it will happen. When you plant at harvest season, the plant that is good, you take out of it. He's talking about agriculture. Again, like the tithe, only farmers and herdsmen can give first fruit. Only farmers and herdsmen can give first fruit. Not engineers. Not lawyers, not doctors, or salary earners. 
So it's ridiculous to bring that to the epistles and be looking for a scripture to join, join. For the international audience, join, join is our local grammar. It means to just be joining all over. To join, join all over the place. It's not practicable. And if you push further, it turns into error. You know, people are held by this kind of things. They deceive them by telling them, tight is for your protection and security. When you tithe, you're protected and secured. What about the Lord is my light and my salvation? Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? What about scriptures like, the Lord is my helper. I shall not be afraid what man can do to me. What about scriptures? Behold, I give you power to trample over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the devil and nothing shall by any means hurt you. What about scriptures? If any man in Christ, in, in him, we live and move. What about scriptures like whatsoever is born of God? overcome the world and this is the victory that overcome the world even our faith what about such scriptures you have to travel to old testament and be combing scriptures that do not add up to use for protection if anybody tells you you have to pay tight to be protected he's just insulting your intelligence what about unbelievers that don't pay tithe and they are protected? They don't even believe in your God and he keeps them. He preserves them. God is not a, he's not a transactionary God. He's a loving father. He's not a contractor. You don't need to mobilize him to take care of you. He takes care of you without mobilization because he loves you. And then they will tell you if you don't pay your first fruit, the rest cannot be blessed. But when you pay that one month salary first, then the remaining 11 months will be blessed. What about businessmen who don't know God and yet the whole year is blessed? They make more money. Like under this lockdown, there are businessmen who don't care about God who have made trillions of dollars and they are not paying your first food. You are not paying your first food. So we, we must make sure we stay within the confines of God's word. You can't be taking tithes and first fruit. And say you are teaching grace. Mm -mm. It's totally out of place. You must teach people clearly. That titan is legalistic. And is dead. That first fruit is not even sensible. It's not sensible. And people say well. You know when the Bible says the land. The land there you know. It means actually you know spiritual. But, but you know what, what the, the writer of Hebrews says? If Joshua had given them rest, he wouldn't have spoken of another day. But there remained therefore a rest for the people of God. And we that believe, not we that pay first fruits, we that believe, we have entered into that rest. And he that has entered into the rest has ceased from his works, even as God ceased from his from the beginning. Glory to God. I say glory to God. I say glory to God. I say glory to God. So the first fruit is mentioned in the epistles. Let's look at the mention of that word. Romans chapter 8 verse 23. Romans chapter 8 verse 23. <clears throat> and not only they but ourselves also. Which have the first fruits of the spirit. Even we ourselves grown within ourselves. Waiting for the adoption to wit. The redemption of our body. So, the word first fruit there is as a spiritual term. What's the first fruit of the spirit? The first fruit of the spirit is the spirit of adoption. Whereby we cry, Abba Father. When we receive the spirit of adoption, it was the first fruit. What is the rest of the first fruit? It is the total redemption of the body when mortality shall be swallowed by immortality. So that's the rest of the harvest. Look at Romans eleven sixteen. Romans 
chapter 11 verse number 16 for if the first fruit be holy the lump is also holy and if the root be holy so are the branches here brother paul was referring to israel and he was making reference from numbers 15 17 to 21 you can read it at home that's the reference brother paul was making here in romans 11 16 from numbers chapter 15 numbers chapter 15 verse 17 to 21 <clears throat> verse 17 to 21 you will get the reference there then there's another one in first corinthians 15 20 christ himself is called the first fruit i don't know how clearer you want it to be first corinthians 15 20 and 23 <clears throat> put it up but now is christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that sleep so jesus is our first fruit look at verse 20 verse 20 23 quickly 15 23 but every man in his own order christ the first fruits afterward they that are christ at his coming so christ is our first fruit look at romans 16 5 the word first fruit there is also used likewise greet the church that is in their house salute my well beloved ethanitus who is the first fruit of achaia unto christ first fruit that means these are the first people that got saved in that place Look at J, I mean 1 Corinthians 16, 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 15. I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanas, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. All right? Look at James 1, 18. <clears throat> James chapter 1, verse 18. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruit of his creature. So Christ is our first fruit, and we are a kind of first fruit. You can read Revelation 14 4 at home of those saved. So there's no place in the world where you can use to sustain the first fruit of the old testament. There's no such place. Let me quickly mention, some Christians actually are bound under these things. And things about bondage is, they will give you result as a fact, but not as a truth. They will give you results as a fact, not as a truth. That's the thing about bondage. It will show you something that looks like result. You know, that's the thing about it. Now, Let's look at the firstborn offering. We have taken care of first fruits. Firstborn offering. Redemption of the firstborn. Why was it done? Because it was done in the Old Testament by Moses. Why were firstborns redeemed? Exodus 13 verse 2. Exodus 13 verse 2. Sanctify unto me all the firstborn. Whatsoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and of beast. It is mine. Exodus 13, 11 to 13. <clears throat> Exodus 13, 11 to 13. And it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore unto thee and to thy fathers, and shall give it thee. Next verse. Now thou shalt set apart unto the Lord all that openeth the matrix, and every firstling that cometh of a beast which thou hast the males shall be the lords next verse and every firstling of an ass thou shalt redeem with a lamb and if thou will not redeem it if thou will not redeem it then thou shalt break his neck and all the firstborn of man among thy children shall thou redeem next verse and it shall be when thy son accept thee in time to come saying why are you offering firstborns that thou shalt say unto him by strength of hand the lord brought us out from egypt from the house of bondage 
Now remember the day they were brought out of Egypt. Look at me. That day the firstborns died. So you offer firstborns as offering. But instead of giving the firstborn, you redeem the son. I think with five shekels, which is nothing. When you redeem the son and they ask your children, ask you, why did you give our first brother as an offering? You use that occasion to share with them how God delivered you out of Egypt. So, firstborn offering was a teaching service that parents will use to teach their children of God's faithfulness in deliverance. And he said, you can redeem your firstborn. You, actually, you should redeem him. Look at Exodus 34, 19. Exodus chapter 34, verse 19. All that opened the matrix is mine. And every firstling among thy cattle, whether ox or sheep, that is male. It has to do with man and cattle. Man, no money, man and cattle. Leviticus 26, I mean 27, 26. Leviticus 27, verse 26. Only the firstling of the beast, which should be the Lord's firstling. No man shall sanctify it, whether it be ox or sheep, it is the Lord's. So on the face of it, you will take the firstborn of both man and animal. And again, there was a memorial of the death of the firstborn in Egypt in that operation. It's to say we know we were exempted. We know we were exempted from that general disaster. So you bring the firstborn of both man and beast. Now look at Numbers 34.3. Please pay attention. Numbers 34.3. Then your south quarter shall be from the wilderness of Zin along by the coast of Edom. And your south border shall be the utmost coast of the salt sea eastward. Look at Numbers 18.16. Numbers 18.16. And those that are to be redeemed from a month old shall thou redeem according to thine estimation for the money of five shekels five shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary which is 20 geras this is nothing this five shekel is small money maybe 100 naira or one dollar you bring your firstborn lord i have brought my firstborn but i'm redeeming him take five shekel firstborn come daddy why do you take brought up to hand over to god all right sit down everybody we were in egypt and by a mighty hand, God brought us. And the day of our deliverance, the firstborns of Egypt died. So, since then, we were given an instruction that when we have firstborns, we offer them to the Lord and we redeem them and use it to teach you of the faithfulness of God. That's what the first fruit was about. It's not to be collecting people's salaries and profits every year. That's fraud. So, you see, there's firstborn offering, which means you will bring the animal and bring the man. But because the man were human beings, you now redeem your child. Rather than give the person over to the high priest as offering, you will now look for money in exchange of that. That was the point. Money in exchange. And the ransom was very minimal. Look at Exodus 12. Exodus 12, 12. <clears throat> Exodus 12, 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborns in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. That's why the first fruit is man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I, the Lord. You can read the rest at home. So it was basically for everybody in Egypt. But they were exempted. So this is to remind them of what had happened. Exodus 13, 14. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 13, verse number 14. And it shall be when thy son accept thee in time to come, saying, What is this? That thou shalt say unto him, By strength of hand, the Lord brought us out from Egypt, from the house of bondage. He said, When your son asks you, tell your son what had happened. Now, what was the buyback? The buyback was redemption. 
The buyback was redemption. Look at Numbers chapter 3 verse 47. Numbers 3, 47 and 48. Thou shalt take five shekels apiece by the pole. After the shekel of the sanctuary shalt thou take them. The shekel is 20 geras. Next verse. And thou shalt give the money wherewith the odd number of them is to be redeemed unto Aaron and to his sons. So rather than put a human being, give five shekels to redeem him. Are we in the building here? Are we in the building? Again, you, you can read the replacement was annual. You can read Numbers 18, 16. Numbers 18, 16. And you will find it as a replacement annual in Exodus 22, 29 to 30. Exodus 22, 29 to 30. So based on this, there's, there's now an annual replacement by way of giving. And it has to be without blemish, the first fruit. Okay? Deuteronomy 15, 17. Put it up for me. Deuteronomy 15, 17. <clears throat> then thou shalt take an awl and thrust it through his ear unto the door. And it shall be thy servant forever and also thy maid servant. Thou shalt do likewise. Give me Numbers 18, 17. Numbers 18, Numbers 18, 17. <clears throat> but the firstling of a cow or the firstling of a sheep. Or the firstling of a goat, thou shalt not redeem. They are holy. Thou shalt sprinkle their blood upon the altar, and shall burn their fat for an offering made by fire, for a sweet savor unto the Lord. So you redeem human beings, but you offer animals. So based on this, there was a replacement. If it is with blemish, then the priest will eat it like common food. Like a goat that has blemish, you know. Okay. Deuteronomy 15, 21. Mm -mm. Deuteronomy 15, 21 to 23. And if there be any blemish therein as if it be lame or blind or have any ill blemish, thou shalt not sacrifice it unto the Lord thy God. Next verse. Thou shalt eat it within thy gates. The unclean and the clean person shall eat it alike as the rubric and as the heart. Only thou shalt not eat the blood thereof. Thou shalt pour it upon the ground as water. The animals are not to be used for sacrifice. If they are lame or blind. Again, look at the significance of that offering. It is to remind them of what happened in the land of Egypt. Of which you and I have no part in. None of us came from Egypt. And even if you came from Egypt today, you are not in Canaan. <laughs> For those watching me in Egypt, you are not in Canaan. You are still in Egypt. The people that give first fruit are those that came out of Egypt and went to Canaan. A land that flows with milk and honey. So it was Moses' way of making them remember how they were liberated from Egypt in spite of their works. It was another way of putting them in sin consciousness. You know, Moses like using sin consciousness to, to control them. So anybody using this today is either ignorant or very, very wicked. Because to present God like someone who wants your firstborn is very ridiculous. And then he wants money. The Bible lets us know it was the destroyer that destroyed them. First Corinthians chapter 5 verse 7. Pay attention. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. <clears throat> Purge out therefore the old living, that you may be a new lump, as you are unliving. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrifice for us. We don't need animal, we don't need farm products. Christ is our sacrifice. Christ is our first fruit. Christ is our sacrifice. Christ is our first fruit. So, no first fruit offering. I heard a pastor preach somewhere and he was talking about Abraham offered Isaac and then he kept preaching on 
Isaac offering, Isaac offering. And at the end of his preaching, he said, tonight, every one of you will bring your Isaac to the altar. And there was a family that had a child, but the husband doesn't have work and the wife doesn't have work. And they don't know how to raise their child. So in the midst of the offering, they came and dropped their baby on the altar and went back. So the man of God said, eh, I didn't mean human being. Come and carry your child. So you want me to buy baby milk and all that and raise the child. Then the child will come back to you. No, 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 no. When I'm talking of Isaac, he's not human being. It's Isaac in monetary terms. Can you see that? Isaac was a human being. <laughs> I wish more parents would drop their children for men of God. Just train him for us. <laughs> when he grows, he will come back home. <laughs> Where you man die. <laughs> Praise God. It's, it's, it's one man of God, one very seasoned, respected man of God in Nigeria who said every time you see a church comes up with a strange teaching on money, it's because they want to do a project. They'll be looking for scriptures to twist. Giving it different names. Ebenezer offering. Ebenezer. You know, uh, Isaac. Isaac offering. Rehoboat offering. Rehoboat offering. <laughs> you have a duty to sit people down and patiently engage them. And I'm talking to all of you that follow my teachings. Because some of them are just ignorant. You know, don't be arrogant, just be calm, take time, be patient. And that's why I took time to give you all the scriptures, not for a show of knowledge, so that people can be helped. The intent for all of this is not to make somebody look bad, it's so that people can be helped, so that the body of Christ can move forward and experience God's glory like never before. Some people in churches are actually not born again, they're in churches. They just came to churches for insurance because pastors told them, if you come to our church, you'll be fine. If you come to our church, there'll be no problem. So they came to church, but they're not born again. And some came for security from poverty because they have been told that God can make them rich whether they work or not. Many of them are not born again. And that's not the gospel. That cannot save anybody. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. For as much as you know, that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. Tradition means using Old Testament practices to collect offering. Tradition from your fathers. Next verse. But, verse 19, with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot received by tradition debunking first fruit offering firstborn offering altar versus altar offering go to your village bring sand and when bringing it add a sacrifice to it the heavier your sacrifice the faster your intervention stop that whom the song says free. It's free indeed. The reason why many people are not teaching the finished work of Christ is because once you teach that you can't control people. So in order for you to control people, you keep them away from the finished work of Christ and keep promoting the teachings of Moses. Walks, walks, walks. Because with walks, you can manipulate people. With walks, you can curse people. With the teaching of works, you keep the people always feeling inadequate. Always feeling, I've not done enough. I need to do more. Always feeling, I need to try more. God cannot hear my prayer if I don't try more. So it keeps you in works. It keeps you in guilt. It keeps you in condemnation. And people in that condition, anybody can manipulate them because they don't know their left from their right. But when we start feeding you the finished work of Christ, you begin to see your real reality in Christ that the job has been done. Since it has been done, the next thing is to grow. And men of God don't like that. They will rather deceive and uh, manipulate you. But not people that follow my teachings judiciously. Nobody will deceive you. You will help many people in this generation. 
Praise God. So that means our offering and our givings have nothing to do with our relationship with God. Our offerings and our givings have nothing to do with our relationship with God because Jesus is our perfect sacrifice. The New Testament doesn't use things at all. Whether oil, bread, wine, salt, wristband, prayer, shawl, the New Testament doesn't use any of those things. And you know, Israel makes billions out of tourism. Billions every year. Meanwhile, the people in Israel that are taking people around to show them those, those, those places don't believe in it. They are not interested. For them, it is economy for their country. Since you are stupid not to read your Bible, since you are so foolish, you have a Bible you cannot read, come and pay for ignorance. Because if you have read your Bible very well, you will know that Jesus said, you shall neither in this mountain or in Jerusalem. Jesus said, no more worship in Jerusalem. But the time cometh, now is, true worshipers worship in spirit. For we are the circumcision that worship God in the spirit and have no confidence in the flesh. But since you are lazy to read your Bible, go to Israel and carry oil, carry handkerchief. Carry water. You know people come back with kegs of, of water from Israel. River Jordan. Eh? Yes. They, they, they buy prayer shoals. They bring potter potter from Israel. Potter potter is clay. Clay. <laughs> how, how can a man go to Israel and come back with clay? There is no slavery that is as serious as that modern day slavery Christians going to Israel and packing water buying oil buying clay with water in kegs and coming back like a man that went to the bush and even with all the Israeli water demons are still slapping them left right center <laughs> it's modern day slavery self imposed slaves because you refuse to read your bible 2000 years ago some people went to the tomb of Jesus to look for Jesus the angel said to them why are you seeking the living among the dead he's no longer here 2000 years ago he's no longer there is it today even the tomb of Jesus in Israel is not the real tomb they just carved a place for you to bring your money most of those sites are not the real places. Because during the destruction of Israel in AD 70, all those things were destroyed. So Israel had to look for a way to take advantage of ignorant Christians by creating those things and giving them Bible names to feed on your ignorance. One of the greatest economies of Israel is tourism from ignorant Christians. Ignorant Christians. They go to a wall and they want to pray on a wall. They call it wailing wall. Why, why wouldn't you be wailing all your life when you're going to wailing wall? When the father said, before you call, I will answer. What are you wailing there for? He that seeketh findeth. He that knocketh, the door shall be opened. Ignorance is so expensive. The New Testament doesn't use any of those things. How can a man be parading Jerusalem? Walking Jerusalem just like John. I want to be ready. Get born again, my friend. Get born again. Get born again, my friend. Glory. You take money and sponsor ignorance and illiteracy. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1 as I round up. Are you blessed tonight? Glory to God. For the law having a shadow of good things to come. And not the very image of the things can never. Anointing oil can never. Bread and rabbina can never. Water from Israel can never. With those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually 
make the commas there run to perfect. Look at verse 2. For then will they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshippers once purged shall have had no more conscience of sins. Verse 3. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every yearly pilgrimage. Yearly pilgrimage. Mm -mm -mm. To think that God requires something from you is sin consciousness. To think that God is requiring something from you is sin consciousness. How then do we give? Don't give first fruits and don't pay tithe. I have even heard of Jubilee offerings. Hmm. People are still doing all of those things. It shows you how thick bondage is. You know, some people, even with the clear explanation that I've done of these scriptures, they will still say, But anyway, what about but? But uh, are you are you saying that uh, what about the spiritual with clear exegesis in black and white? That's how thick the bondage can be. That the prison door can be open and the prisoner say, "I prefer it here. I don't like freedom. I'm used to this. It is now my comfort zone." <laughs> That's why we pray for people that the eyes of their understanding. Be enlightened. We pray for people that imaginations that contradict the finished work of Christ be brought down. That they be brought under subjection to the obedience of Christ. Glory to God. Are you blessed tonight? From tomorrow we'll start talking about what Jesus taught about giving. We will start that tomorrow. What Jesus taught about giving. So from tomorrow we start talking about giving in the New Testament. The right way to give. The Bible way to give. And all of that in the New Testament. And we also talk about should a Christian give tithes. We will look at all of that from scriptures. I will have sound exegesis from tomorrow. So if you know pastors that are looking for how to help their members. Ask them to tune in tomorrow. If you know people that are looking for how to know what to do. Having known what not to do. Ask them to tune in from tomorrow. Tomorrow evening we start Sunday first service. Sunday second service. We, we dedicate three sessions to open up what New Testament givings are supposed to be like. And you'll be glad you're a part of it. Stand on your feet. Let's close this service tonight. Glory! Amen. Amen. Lift your right hands. Father, we rejoice that we have the privilege of learning. The privilege of being equipped. The privilege of being trained. And we rejoice that through your word, you are raising an army of people globally who will preach the truth of the gospel without compromise. And we decree that as the word keeps going forth, your people are being built up, mindsets are corrected, imaginations are brought under subjection to the obedience of Christ. And we decree that your word is building up your people and giving your people all the nourishment that they require to stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has set us free. And we rejoice that no one hearing these teachings will allow himself to be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Father, we rejoice that your people have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. I speak to you hearing the sound of my voice. God has not given to you the spirit of fear, but of love, of power, and of a sound mind. Every voice of the enemy harassing you, I command you to shut up in the name of Jesus. We rebuke sickness, disease, oppression, Satan, Get your hands off in the name of Jesus. Sick bodies be healed. Be healed. Be healed in the name of Jesus. We speak to your nerves, your tissues, your tendons, your ligaments, your vein, your artery. Agaba, nakato, makete. Where there is weakness in your limbs. Where your limbs are weak. Where your limbs are weak and they have made you unable to walk. Where your limbs are weak and they have made you unable to use your hand. I command your ankles receive strength, receive strength, receive strength, receive strength, receive strength. Rise up and walk. Do what you couldn't do before. Rise up and walk. The power of God is moving through your body, through your bones, through your joints, through, through your marrow. The power of God is moving in your brain cells. We command your brain cells to be refreshed, quickened, rejuvenated. Brain cells. 
come alive. We command the right signals to flow from your brain cells into your body. In the name of Jesus. Tumors melt out. Growths melt out. Deaf ears be opened. Blind eyes be restored. In the name of Jesus. We release creative miracles. Creative miracles. Creative miracles. Creative miracles. Receive, receive, receive. Every organ of your body that was damaged, we command a creative miracle to restore that organ. Restore that organ. That's the power. That's the power of God. Flowing through your, your body. Flowing through your organs. Your, your heart. Your liver. Your kidneys. Be quickened. Your kidneys. Be quickened. Jakato. Makata. Makete. Makala. Egreda. Socorro. Tokuba. 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 Satan. Get your hands off. In the name of Jesus. Now begin to do what you couldn't do before. Quickly. Begin to move that leg. Move that leg. Stand up from that bed. Stand up from that chair. Jakata. 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 There's no distance in the spirit. A miracle is taking place right now. Hegeba. 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 I command migraines. I command diseases and sicknesses that are discomforting your body. Melt out. Pain. Go. In the name of Jesus. Jatom Branaka, 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 Hagabaya, 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 yes, go, go, walk, 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 take that step, Hagaba, 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 take that step, Agento, 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 in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for answered prayer. Oh, Ziputala. Thank you, Father, for answered prayer. Oh, Jakotana. Thank you, Father, for answered prayer. 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 Thank you, Father, for miracles. We give you praise. Hallelujah. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. I, I, I'm telling you, miracles all over the place. Miracles all over the place. Go ahead. Keep doing what you couldn't do before. Go ahead. Don't stop. Keep moving around that room. Keep moving. Keep moving. You're not going to fall. Move. You're not going to fall. Move. Thank you, Father. Praise you, Father. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God. And we expect your testimonies. Because miracles are happening all over the place. On radio, on television, on social media. Miracles are happening right where you are. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Grab your offerings we want to give in honor of Christ and in honor of the finished work of Christ. And every time you give your offering, you're making it easy for us to get this gospel to the ends of the earth. You're making it easy for us to get this gospel to where people whom Christ died for are waiting for this truth. Every time you give to us, you are sponsoring the truth and enabling it to find expression. You know, scripture says, let them that favor his righteous cause, let them shout for joy. And let them continually say, the Lord be magnified. That has pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. God is magnified. God has pleasure in your prosperity much more as you minister to the needs of the saints. Every time you give, you are ministering to the needs of the saints. And I want you to know that we appreciate people like you and every one of you that is partnering with this ministry. Lift up your offerings. Father, we pray for everybody giving tonight. We decree that our offerings are a sweet smell. And we thank you for the privilege of making a difference on the gospel. Thank you for the blessing upon your people tonight. And thank you for answered prayer. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says a powerful amen. amen. Glory to God. Ah, glory. You don't want to miss, you don't want to miss the rest of the week. Tomorrow, 6 p.m. GMT plus one. But I'm joining Mr. Michael Bush right now in the other studio. 
We'll answer your questions, respond to your calls, respond to your queries, and just bring more clarity in the doctrine of Christ. But guys, it's always a joy to serve you the grace of God. We look forward to being with you again tomorrow evening in the teaching of the word. And uh, I tell you, get more people to be part of it. And until then, enjoy the grace of Christ. Let's celebrate viewers around the world for being a part of this service tonight. Glory! Amen! Woo! We Glory to God! You have been blessed by this message. For these, all the messages and books by Dr. Abel Damina, please call plus 234-806-800-9939 or email powercityoffice at gmail.com. FCMB, there is Zenith and there is UBA on this edition of the program with the account name of Costain at Power City International. I'm going to start with UBA. So 139 26 465, 139 26 465, that's for UBA, Power City International. Zenith is 10 12 36 59 12. 10 12 36 59 12. Account name Power City International and the same for FCMB. 2982-68-2028, that's announcement number one. Quickly, quickly, announcement number two, and that is for sponsorship. You can call up plus uh, 234-803-275-6104, or you just send an email or two to Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. Remember, Dr. Abel Damina, the doctor is D-R-O. Okay, I think I'm set. Uh, even Global Baba himself is set. Okay, let me see whether I can just join our friends on, um, yeah, our friends on the social media. You know, as Global Baba always says, they, they make this program tick. They make this program what it is. Um, Dixon Maruza, I'd like to thank you. God is love. T. Audu, I'd like to thank you. Pastor Msapaila Mubangawesu, Oliver, I'd like to thank you. Enoekwa, I'd like to thank you too. There's Dixon Marusa again. I just mentioned that. Nachi Oko Chuku, that's what it is. And there is um, Chris Covenant, I'd like to thank you for joining us. Lost Cruz in Italy, I'd like to thank you more. Fidelia Adakue Doziem Ofebu is also there, and so to learn. Chisanda and Abu, uh, Abdu should be. And finally, 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 can I just take one or two now? There is uh, Busha Bayeso and um, Vivian Ochai. Global Bias here, help me, the world, to welcome this award winning author. He's written, um, you know, more, than, more, more books than you can count. Uh, very soon, Global Baba, your books are going to be uncountable, you know. So, and um, he's a, it's an international televangelist and somebody who teaches the Bible like no one else. Help me welcome Global Baba, Dr. Ebel Damina. The Intercontinental, Mr. Bush. So, so good nice to see, to see you, see you Baba. again today. So nice, so nice. What a blessing. So nice. And then the church auditorium, you know, packed full. Yes. It's so nice to see that. The Word of God. Everybody Absolutely. is learning. Everyone is yeah. uh, in haste. And they are learning. Yes. They are learning real good. Praise so um, holy, um, uh, I was going to say holy uh, global Baba, you know. <laughs> but yesterday, yes, you know, global Baba, I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you do it. Every day you must drop. Yesterday you told us that uh, holiness is not about sinlessness. Yes. That holiness is being called out. Hagios, yes. the Greek word hagios, to be set apart. So, but we've been, been using it all along wrongly. 
Yeah, you know, that's, that's the problem with Bible teaching. Robert, but why don't you just sit us down one day and just pack all those things that we've been doing wrongly and tell us one day, not today you drop <laughs> one, tomorrow. You know, because I don't understand. For instance, you said baptism. Yes. It could be an action, it could be something else. It could so, be teaching. Yes. We, we keep teaching it small, small, precept upon precept. That's the way it's taught. Okay. It's going to take a bit of time, but we'll, we'll, we'll get there. Okay. Without any further ado, the Global Bar by yesterday... We ended, uh, it, would, it would seem mid-air, because yes. we're just doing anonymous, 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 and the time was up. So we'll start with some anonymous entries today. Please, I want to know, Global Baba, is it a must that believers pray for forgiveness after they might have done wrong, or just the acknowledgement in our heart or mind is enough? Please, if possible, I also need Bible passages to support the answer. Thank you, Global Baba. Well, first of all, when it has to do with forgiveness or uh, receiving forgiveness, it's what you receive the day you got born again. And from the moment you're born again, you are eternally forgiven. When you do wrong, you don't need to confess. You don't need to cry. You don't need to beg. You just need to acknowledge. Knowing that you've done wrong is the beginning. So what do you do? You make the adjustments. It's like you're looking at a mirror and you make adjustments. The word of God is a mirror. So when you do wrong, all you need to do is make adjustments. And when you make the adjustments, you, you, it's fixed. The blood of Jesus is constantly washing you, even when you know, when you don't know. You know, the reason why people think you have to confess your sin is because people are thinking of lying, stealing, you know, and all of those. But there are sins that are more serious, that are not seen with the human eye, that people commit all the time. For example, he that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him is sin. Okay? The Bible also tells us that if you look at a woman lustfully, just looking at her, you've committed adultery. So there are such sins, sins like, you know, unforgiveness, malice, they are all there. And every day people get involved with one sin or the other. And you may not even know when you've done them. And so that's why the guarantee is Jesus. His blood is constantly washing. So when you do wrong, what you do is you, you quickly stay away from it, get out of it. Like the prodigal son stood up and said, I will go back to my father. He stood up and he walked back home. That's the way it is in, in the kingdom. Now scriptures, there are many scriptures. So my advice, get my book, get my book on the Christocentric meal. I took a whole month in the Christocentric meal, 30 days of teaching on the forgiveness of sins with all the scriptures well explained. Okay, Global Baba, I take two more anonymous entries and then we make progress. This one, what is baptism, Global Baba? When people say that uh, when you are baptized, the old sinful person dies and emerges from the water to walk in newness of life. What does that mean exactly, Global Baba? And what happens if we stumble in a Christian walk after baptism? Well, again, that word baptism has to be well explained within the context. There's no omnibus application to any word of scripture. I can't really take this time to teach you what baptism is. But like we said, there is baptism as an act, and there's a baptism as teaching. And you have to be able to know which one we're talking about at which time in scripture. But baptism has nothing to do with salvation i mean water baptism has nothing to do with salvation baptism is both receiving christ and water and teaching the scripture you quoted in romans chapter 6 which is baptized into the newness of life is not water baptism it's receiving jesus into your heart the moment you receive jesus you are baptized into christ that is you are immersed Christ has taken over your whole being. He has become your life. He has become everything to you. That's what it means. Okay, Global Baba, I'm wondering whether that um, very analytical response you've given preempts um, the next uh, leg of okay. the question by the same sender. Is it, Global Baba, is there just um, one way or there are more ways to get baptized? Or does the Bible tell us how it should be done? Does it matter? Well, again, in being baptized, like we said, you just get born again. That's what it means to be baptized. Uh, the water baptism in the Bible is not, it, it was just given to John the Baptist so that it can be used to identify Jesus. That's the whole purpose of water baptism. And once Jesus was identified, John and his baptism expired. Now Jesus baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So the moment you receive Christ, he comes into your heart, you are saved eternally. Global Baba, and this is the last anonymous piece that I'll be taking on this edition of the program. What is the message in Hebrews 6, 4? 
Once, Global Boy, you said it's the guarantee of eternal salvation. The other day, you said it's speaking to the unbelieving Jews. We'll appreciate clarification so I may be certain when I teach others too. Well, again, I think you're, you're not following well because uh, the book of Hebrews is the book written to Jews believing, unbelieving, and will be believing. And when he was talking in the book of Hebrews chapter 6, he was telling them to abandon the, the, all the rituals of the Old Testament and go on to perfection. And then he now said that this, will be, this we will do if God permits, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, have tasted of the heavenly gift, if they shall fall away, to renew them again to repentance. Now this is where the lacuna is. Seeing they crucify to themselves afresh the Son of God and put him to an open shame. Can you crucify Jesus a second time? It's not possible. The prophecies say he will be crucified once. The Bible tells us that he died once and he rose. He's not going to die anymore. So if Jesus will not be crucified a second time, it means if a believer receives Christ, he cannot fall away because there is no second crucifixion of Jesus. So once you are saved, you are saved eternally. That's why that Hebrews chapter 6 verse 4 is actually the scripture that guarantees eternal salvation. However, if you, if you reach out to our office, you'll be shown how to download one of my books for free that deals with such scriptures and gives you depth of exegesis on those subjects. As I said, we're done with anonymous entries that just... There is just one near anonymous entry that I must um, handle before I go on to talk of other things. I must just talk of this one. It says, greetings. My name is Lucia. doesn't tell us where she's writing from, but it says, Global Baba, I need help with negative words that come to my mind every time. They are not okay at all. I'm a born-again Christian. This has been going on for too long. I've tried all things. When I try to meditate, I end up focusing on these words, these negative words, instead of the word. It feels global power, like my mind is controlling me. I need your counseling. Well, if your, mind, if your mind is full of negative words, it means you are not spending enough time to eat the word of God. Garbage in, garbage out. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It means you're putting in a lot of rubbish into you. Even though you're born again, you're spending a lot of time on carnal things, on things that are not of spiritual edification. So what do you need to do? You need to change your company. You need to change your focus. You need to refocus and begin to spend more time on the word of God. The more you spend time on the word of God, the more the word of God goes into you, the more it begins to affect the kind of things that you think about. So spend more time on the teaching of God's word. And that's the way to get out of it. Okay, Global Baba, by the way, this edition of the program is the African edition. We're going to focus only around on, or only on Africa. We owe it's uh, on the radar now. It says, hello, Global Baba and Mr. Michael Bush. My name is Otto Bong. I write from Uyo. Global Baba, I have a problem with the lifestyle that I live. I find it very difficult to change. Can it be possible for one to live and die without being able to change Global Baba? I know that the things I do are bad, but I can't just change my character. I don't know what's happening to me. Global Baba, I have tried many times, but as I write to you, I feel very empty and I have no comfort in my strength. Sometimes... Things very bad will happen, making me to run out of uh, home with nowhere to go that I would unbelievably, Global Baba, start with the very same thing I ran from. Please help me, Global Baba. All right. Okay. Global Baba, I hear that. Uh, okay, the callers are here. Okay. I said 10 minutes and 10 minutes uh, just now. This first caller. Hello. Good evening, Global Papa. Good evening. Bless you. Good evening, Intercontinental, Mr. So, Master Bush. Thank you for joining us, yes. Your name, will you call My name from? is Reverend Sam Adala. Aha, okay. <laughs> we should go, I should say. Yeah, sure. Welcome to our show. Yeah, welcome back, Mr. You. Michael Bush. Thank you. Papa, we thank God for the ministry the Lord has committed into your hands. We are daily blessed. And I'm privileged to tell the audience and the whole world that this is God sent man of God in whom God is pleased. The whole world, let us hear him. For this is the generation whereby the truth is being revealed. And we are catching the revelation, Papa. 
Reverend Doctor Hebe Damina, we bless your life. We bless God for you. Thank you. And we thank God for the producer. Sir, I just want to ask a question for tonight. Then other days I keep on touching with the anointing. Good. When we talk about this word holiness, even superpower general overseer, till today they are still telling us that without this holiness, no man can enter the kingdom of God. How do small boys like us convince us when we teach some of these things? Because they say even the small lie is baby lies. It's going to end. Everything end. Everything end. And now we see deeper revelation on the word holiness. We have thought that holiness is being totally free from sin. Thank you, Papa, as you help us on this. Well, that, that scripture that says without holiness no man shall see the Lord actually is not being interpreted well. It has been abused very seriously in Africa most especially. You know, um, uh, when the Bible says follow all men with peace in the book of Hebrews and without holiness no man shall see the Lord. It was talking about interpersonal relationship. Our relationship with one another. That you should follow each other with peace. You should live peace with other brethren because without living the conduct that reflects you as a believer, people around will not see Christ in your life. That's what he's talking about. So he's dealing with Christian conduct which exemplifies the life of Christ so that people around can see Christ. He doesn't mean that you will not see the Lord like see Christ. You're already in Christ. Christ is already in you. You know, and if Christ is in you and you're in him already, nothing can separate that union. So that verse was actually talking about unbelievers seeing our conduct and knowing that we are with Christ. Okay, from uh, Abia, we we'll still stay on Abia Global Baba. He says, Hello, Global Baba. I'm Chaplain Marcel from Abia State. I'm facing serious challenges in my business. I take a loan to grow my business, but nothing comes out every time, Global Baba. This has continued for too long and made things too difficult for me. What on earth is the matter, Global Baba? Well, the matter is that you need somebody who is an expert on financial advice to counsel you and help you, an expert in finances, because you may be doing the wrong thing with the loans you're collecting, and you may have even no need for the loans. Maybe it's not even a loan you need, you just need good ideas and all of that. So talk to people who are experts in that field, I'm not an authority there. That's why I'm shying away from giving you counsel on that. My expertise is the word of God. Bless you. Global Baba. Global Baba. Okay, from, from Abia, let's get to Benue. I says, dear Mr. Bush, my name is Samuel. I write from Benue State. Is there anything that God cannot forgive? Please put that question to Global Baba for me. Like belonging to one of the world's renowned occult organizations like Illuminati, free mercenary, etc. I understand their members surrender their souls to their gods. Can they retract and God accepts them or they are doomed for life? Well, there's no sin that God cannot forgive. Jesus died to save everybody. So if a man is in Illuminati or in a cult somewhere where he has vowed his soul to the devil, all he needs is the preaching of the gospel. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And if he accepts the gospel, he will be free from all of those affiliations. From Benue State, we go to... Next door, Nasarawa State. First door, this caller. Hello. Hello, sir. Good evening, sir. Welcome to the program. You know where you're calling from? I'm coming. I'm calling from Miracle, sir. My name is Miracle. Miracle again? Yes. Yes, go ahead. I, I have another question. Fire on. Yes, sir. Um, Jesus, said, Jesus said about the about the post, post prophet that after after the first prayer speech, that um, rapture will not take place in that generation passes. What does that mean? And the generation has passed, and rapture will not take place. You are reading your Bible upside down. <laughs> you are not reading it well. Because what you are trying to say is that Jesus lied. And it is not Jesus, it is you that is wrong. Because you are not reading well. So my advice for you, Miracle, 
Carry that scripture where you read. Read from the beginning of that chapter. Read the whole chapter. Read the whole book. Read Matthew 1 to the end. When you finish the whole book, if you're really serious, then come back to that chapter 24 and read the previous verses and the verses after. If you still do not understand my advice, order for my book, The Last Days. The Last Days did a lot of justice on Matthew 24. It will give you verse by verse exegesis explaining the whole concept for you to understand. Bless you. Miracle in Oweri, you are our last caller on this edition of the program just as we make way from Benue into Nasarawa State. My name is Reverend Elisha Nzunde Shamaki. I'm watching from Masaka. Okay, Masaka is actually in Karu, local government area of Nasarawa State. The first time I stumbled on KLN, I concluded, Lobo Baba, that the Lord is using you, Dr. Ebel Damina, and other men of God to bring the gospel raw without compromise to our generation. Since then, I've decided to stay tuned to the channel. Now I know deliverance is not a prayer, but a preacher. There is nothing like deliverance ministry or service. God bless you, and please keep up the good work. Shalom. Amen. Thank you for reaching out. We love you. Stay with us and keep watching. We're hitting out of, our, out of Nigeria and into other parts of Africa by road. Ghana, here we come. Hi, Dr. Damina. My name is Richmond Mills from why, Ghana. Why by road? Yeah, because <laughs> that's, that's, that's a very good question. And I need to explain, you know, um, from Nasarawa, there's no, there's no airport. Okay, you know, okay. So we, we must go by road. Okay, okay. We must go by road. That's a All long right. drive. All right. You know. <laughs> You know, Global Bar, I'm the pilot. I know, know, I know. So I, I, I look at everywhere. I'm with you. I'm so with sometimes you. we go by road, sometimes we go by, by water. Uh, so sure. Yeah. Okay, so I listened to your teaching on Facebook, Global Bar, Bar, on Facebook Live a few weeks ago, and you said God does not promise long life. I read in the book of First Kings 3, 1 to 15, that after King Solomon had made a thousand burnt offering unto God, he appeared to him in his dream and asked him to request for anything he wanted, and he, and he would answer. Solomon requested for wisdom to rule God's people. In verse 14, Global Baba, to be precise, God said, And if thou wilt walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as thy father David did walk, then I will lengthen thy days. Is it guaranteed that if man keeps the commandments of God, there is an assurance of long days on earth? I pray for response immediately. There's a difference between long life and lengthen of your days. They are not the same. So uh, you need to go and study. Find out what does it mean to lengthen a day and what it means to live long. They are not the same. A lengthened day means God will make your days very, very productive. When you have a lengthened day, that means what somebody uses 10 years to do, you achieved it within 24 hours. That is God lengthening your day. Okay, uh, Global Baba from Ghana, we heard him to Zambia, who could be flying now. It says, hello, Global Baba, there is a search which only ends when Christ is revealed to you. For me, immediately, I listened to Global Baba in 2016. My spirit suddenly agreed with him that what he is teaching is the truth of the gospel. Since then, I have not missed Global Baba's teachings because in Christ I have arrived home. I'm Leonard from Kitwe, Zambia. Bless you, Leonard. We're glad to have and know that you're growing. Still from Zambia, Pastor Chilungu writes, I'm one of your students in the ongoing mentorship program, Global Baba. I really need your counseling on our marriage. For we got divorced, but we want to come back together. And this can only take place when we go through your counseling. Thank you, Global Bar. Bar. Greetings from my family and me and the entire Everlasting Joy Church in Zambia. Wow, praise the Lord. Congratulations. We'll be willing to counsel with you and your wife so you can reconcile and come back together and serve God and fulfill God's purpose together. We rejoice with the step you're already taking. Global Bar, let's go to Rwanda next. Quickly, quickly, it's Fred. Fred writes from Rwanda. What's the meaning? Global Baba, of if you don't get hot or cold, I would vomit you in Revelation 3.16. Does this refer to loss of salvation? No, it refers, to, it refers to a mixture of law and grace. That's what it refers to, a mixture. You are neither hot nor cold. You are neither in grace or in law. You are mixing it. So you make up your mind whether you want to go to law or you want to go to the finished work of Christ. It was dealing with doctrinal issues in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. Global Baba, we're um, spending the night um, in South Africa. This one says, hello, Global Baba. I recently started to follow your teachings on Facebook. Thank you for the truth of God's Bible teachings. Are women allowed to preach or not? I've read 1 Timothy 2, 12 and 1 Corinthians, and um, I'm getting confused with John 4. 
the Samaritan woman and Mary Magdalene, whom Jesus charged with responsibility at resurrection. This is Kibakile Muleti in Bluefontein, South Africa. Well, I'm glad you are interrogating more. And as you keep interrogating, you will also find where it says, I'll pour my spirit upon all flesh, your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Prophecy is the preaching of the gospel. So, when you see where the Bible says women should keep quiet in the church, Brother Paul was dealing with husband and wife relationship, pointing the woman back to the place of submission. That's all it means. It does not affect women preaching and fulfilling ministry. That's why the woman who still had four husbands, Jesus allowed her to go and bring a whole city to him. He didn't tell her, go and send your husbands away first before you preach. Okay, so as you grow, as you keep following, you will understand that God wants every man, every woman to preach the gospel because in the spirit, there is no male, there is no female. It's the same Holy Spirit in a man and a woman. And we're all mandated to go to the whole world and preach the gospel to every creature. Global Baba, we must go because time says so. But before we go, we could just take one long minute and um, dwell on some prayer requests. We have a number of prayer requests. Sometimes some people um, talking concerning business, yep. others about their health, others about their marriage, marriage and all of that. Father, we rejoice because of the opportunity we have to demand and to receive on behalf of everyone who are sending a prayer request. We speak healing to those who are in need of healing. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Amen. We speak marital favors, supernatural connections, and marital breakthroughs for those in need of husbands or wives. In the name of Jesus, Amen. receive that miracle. We pray for women in need of fruit of the womb. We declare a miracle in the name of Jesus. Amen. Receive the fruit of the womb in the name of Jesus. Amen. We pray for students who are seeking admission. The favor of God is upon you and we command that supernaturally you receive help and assistance to be admitted in those schools in the name of Jesus. Amen. Father, generally we decree and declare right now the expectations of your people granted are released. Amen. Receive it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Global Baba, we must Praise go. God. This is Michael Bush inviting Global Baba Dr. Abel Damina to take us home on this edition of the program. Intercontinental Mr. Bush, I tell you, it's beginning again and we're so excited to have all of you. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to serve you the grace of God. And don't forget to follow our radio broadcast. They continue tonight at uh, 9 to 10 on Inspiration, 10 to 12 on Heritage. Tomorrow morning, 11 to 1 o'clock radio, Acquire Bomb, 1 to 3, XLFM, 3 to 5, Union you FM. And we're back here again, on 6 p.m. on Comfort FM. We love you guys. Enjoy the grace of Jesus and keep growing in the knowledge of Christ. Till we connect again tomorrow at 6 p.m. GMT plus 1. Be blessed. Good night. Bye from Uyo, Nigeria. Amen. Amen.